When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to Geico.com and you could save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your moves. Another Success for Life podcast will be streaming live today on Periscope. So um, we've had about a few week hiatus. So those of you who have been loyal listeners to the Success for Life podcast, we're back with another great episode. And upcoming on Friday, we expect uh, another um, Sports Tech Guys podcast. So those of you who've been uh, big listeners of what we've been doing, stay with us. This podcast obviously will also then be archived and live on iTunes uh, and any other medium that you listen to your podcast, but we'll also post everything uh, on Twitter as well for you. Uh, today's special guest is a guy I know real well. I've known him since, I believe, 2007, uh, Justin Cavanaugh, who is... Uh, well-known throughout the industry as a tremendous trainer of, of multiple sports, but has built uh, his SSI, Sports and Speed Institute, training facility uh, based around, you know, some of the principles of obviously helping athletes to succeed, focusing on the long term. He also is a big adopter of uh, social media strategies in, in building his business and all different types of methods for that. Um, so, I mean, Justin is really somebody that if you have a training business, if you're trying to become an accomplished trainer, he's somebody that you could really learn a, a lot from. Uh, so we're going to bring Justin Kavanaugh on in just a minute, but I'll just give a little background before I do. Justin and I met down in Florida. He, he was training some athletes down in Florida. He helped out at, I believe it was my Orlando Combine way back in 2007, um, and Justin really has always been someone that, as I've gotten known, has tremendous enthusiasm, not just uh, for what he does, but uh, for his life and how he approaches everything from business to football to uh, training athletes. And Justin's built a practice, uh, obviously training multiple sports, but his passion always has been obviously football uh, having been a football player himself at the University of North Carolina before, he, before getting an injury, um, having coached, having been someone that's trained some of the uh, top sleeper athletes in the NFL for many years. Uh, he's somebody that, uh, that does a tremendous job working with athletes. And the most important part we're going to get to uh, you know, on this podcast as we do in the Success for Life podcast um, we're going to really talk about what motivates him, what has gotten him to where he is today, um, and, and what really kind of drives his business. So I think it's going to be really interesting, especially if you're someone in the sports industry, um, you know, if you're some, an athlete even looking to get recruited and get help and get better, um, you know, talking about football and training and talking about uh, becoming the very best you can be and applying those uh, principles to life. Uh, without further ado, I want to bring on uh, Justin Cavanaugh. So, Justin, how's everything going today? Man, I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to, to hear a little bit of the intro, but I, I gave a little bit of uh, your background um, you know, we've known each other for 
for almost uh, 10 years now, around 10 years, and from the NBC Sports Camps, and I and I think, you know, you've been one of uh, the guys that I've gotten to know over the years that has such a passion, not just for football, but in everything he does, you know, you apply for business. I always have uh, a tremendous amount of respect for someone that has a singular focus, but also has the ability to really um, talk on a lot of different topics, and that's somebody like yourself. So, uh, you know, I'm really glad to have you on. Um, well, I without appreciate further, being here. Yeah, without further ado, I want to get a little bit of, you know, and I covered your background, but I'd like for you to really kind of tell everybody about, you know, where you came from, um, just a little bit of background. You know, you can go all the way back to high school if you want and, and some of the things that motivated you and to where you are today. Absolutely, Dan. I appreciate it. So, uh, and I'll try to keep this sweet and short, but, um, and everybody, it's kind of like the Hall of Fame speeches, right? Everyone's going to boast a little bit. Everybody, Everybody's a big, little bit taller, better looking, and has better, you know, success than uh, what, people that saw you back then uh, kind of remembers you as, which is kind of cool. But um, so I was a five sport athlete down in Miami and uh, kind of growing up in that area gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of diversity, you know, obviously culturally, but, but from a sports standpoint, you know, across the country, you know, sports has, has a different meaning, you know, to everybody. And for, for a lot of people kind of where I, I grew up, it was a, it was a way out of their circumstances and I feel that, you know, circumstances don't define who you are. It's the way that you deal with them, and everybody deals with them differently. And, and in, in some cases, you know, kids want to get out of their circumstances uh, that, you know, basically their home life or things like that. And for me, I didn't have that problem. Even though I grew up in, in, in an environment and in a culture that was very much like that, I had, you know, some, some of the best parents in the world. You know, I consider myself a spoiled brat uh, with a lot of the things that we were given because we didn't look at outside of people. Like, we never looked at other people's money. And I think that's where, you know, as a culture, people are different. You know, people look at – you only realize you're poor when you start looking at other people's belongings. And uh, we always looked at what we have, kind of what has God has provided us and our families provided us, and then move forward. So, you know, fast forward to kind of what I do today in our business, I kind of like want to individualize everybody's, you know, situation. And I think that's what made us very successful. So, you know, as a five-sport athlete, you know, I got a chance to be around a lot of really good coaches, and it allowed me a platform to then, you know, build my, my coaching philosophy. And my, my experiences in business has been driven a lot off of, my experiences in sport. So, you know, what I've, what I've learned is, you know, as a, as a young athlete that played multiple different sports is that, you know, you have two, you know, at the highest level, you have two types of people. You have people that are the best at what they do from a talent standpoint, and they're just studs. And then you have the people that, that are really good at a lot of different things, but because of those circumstances, they're very aware of what their talents are, and then they figure out a role within that environment. And that's kind of the outfit I was. I was the guy that, that really early on learned that my assets, um, I need to be able to kind of, um, you know, bring them to the, to, the, to the front daily because I didn't have the buffer talent-wise to be able to play with some of the best athletes in the world. And I realized that early on. So I knew that my career was, hey, I was going to hit harder than you. I was going to study film, so I learned the – the, the game better than you, and then I was going to make sure that I was able to lead people or at least uh, drive them to what they wanted to do because that didn't matter my, you know, my, my physical gifts. And uh, I needed to kind of over, over invest in the areas that I was already strong so I was able to, you know, learn my role quickly in whatever sport I was, and that allowed me to kind of, you know, work my way up throughout, you know, the ranks and throughout my career. So as a five-sport athlete, you know, I went on to play college ball, and unfortunately, you know, we have in our minds this idea that, you know, we already know what we're going to do. Like, I think that, you know, elite athletes know exactly, you know, what we want to accomplish. And we've already thought about it. We know what it's going to be like kind of being on, on that pedestal and, and getting that award. And if you had asked me, you know, what I was excited about or prideful about, it wasn't like graduating high school or going to college or any of those things. Those were just like inevitable, right? That was just a byproduct of what my process was going to be. I was going to play in the NFL, and then I was going to go coach somewhere and, and, and live off of my, you know, both celebrity status and my success on the field, you know, 
you know, leveraging that. But, uh, you know, God has different plans for you. And, uh, you know, early in my college career, I, I got hurt. You know, I broke my back, fell through the roof, 25 feet, L4, L5, T1. And uh, that changes everything. So the minute I, you know, hit the ground, I had, you know, I had my agenda and then I had his. So I learned very quickly that, you know, if I don't move and be pliable with my, my interest, then I wouldn't be, I'd be, I would be back in the, in the role that a lot of people were in sport, which they just didn't make it or they didn't realize their role. So I learned really quickly that I was able to give back, uh, leverage some of my experiences and the things that were hard on me and, and use them as, as strengths for other people. And so I fast forward my career then. And ever since then, I've been able to, you know, progress my coaching career, my business career based upon the back of, uh, of, of the success that I had as an athlete, but also the experience that I had working with some really good coaches. And uh, so I'm here now. I'm in, I, you know, born and raised in Miami, put on a college ball, college ball at Carolina, and then opened up a business back down in South Florida. And in 2009, moved up to D.C. area to kind of reinvent, you know, the business that I started down in uh, South Florida and to kind of do it over again to see if that was a new challenge. And, and that's where we are right now. We're just outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia uh, running a, um, a, a pretty high-performance, you know, facility for people that have all different goals. But what I really enjoy doing, and you mentioned earlier, was this kind of, you know, singular focus, but the ability to take that and, and use it in different areas of our lives, like singular focus for my own journey but leveraging my experiences for whatever area that I am in at that time. And um, I really pride myself on that because I, I don't think that we're all meant to just do one thing. I think we have multiple purposes in life and that just depending on the season that we're in, we will figure those things out as we go. And right now, you know, I know my purpose is to be able to provide an opportunity and be a guide for athletes that want to take it to the next level. I know my weakness which is extremely important is if you, as an athlete or as a business person or as a coach, if you don't know your weaknesses, you will get left behind. And my, one of my biggest weaknesses is not, is, is dealing with people that don't know what they want to accomplish. So I am, I am less of the, the, the Dr. Phil of the world uh, that like trying to pull out of you. What do you want to do? What's your why? Like what's your motivation? And I'm more of like the strategy guy to kind of say, okay, if this is what you want to accomplish how do we, you know, create a game plan that, it, that models the success that you want to uh, achieve? And that's what I'm really good at, and I kind of stay in my lane, and, and I'm very comfortable there. I think you touched on some really interesting things as far as, um, you know, what you end up doing. I, you know, I was really curious about is going back to, like, high school and college, and, and obviously you ended up opening up your own business. Were there any uh, people that were business mentors for you, or did you figure it out on your own? How, how did you uh, develop that kind of mindset that you wanted to, to become an entrepreneur? Was it the sports that took you there, or was it the business that took you there? Um, I, think it, I think it started with my parents. I mean, to be honest with you about our situation, they, I say I was spoiled, but they didn't have the means to provide, like, uh, dispendable income. So I wasn't able to be like, all right, cool, I wanted a pair of shoes. Like, I'll go get that. So if I wanted something, you, you, had to, you had to go get it. And the only way to do that was to find little, you know, we didn't get an allowance. You know, the idea of an allowance was foreign to me. As I see my friends that I used to, like, get so bad that, like, they get a dollar, two dollars a week for just, you know, doing the, the crap that they're supposed to do. You know, my parents made it very clear, like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. So I'm supposed to, like, pat you on the back, give you a sticker, give you money for the things that you're supposed to do. It's the things that you want that aren't necessarily, you know, uh, things that you need, um, what you should earn for. Like if, the, if it's something that you absolutely want and it's not a, like a necessity for you to breathe and live and to continue to move forward, then why should I give you any, you know, anything extra? And that was our parents' philosophy. So I had to cut grass. I had to clean cars. I had to burn CDs and make mixtapes as a DJ. So I started as an entrepreneur, I would say like the first big, big thing, because I think we all do these, you know, the little stuff was I was a, a an athlete. I played multiple sports, you know, through high school, so I didn't have the ability to go work at a Publix or a grocery store or anything else 
uh, as a as a few hours a week. I didn't have that ability. So I I loved music and I enjoyed you know the guy at the party that kind of controlled the party, you know. And I didn't want to be the guy dancing and making a fool out of himself uh, as the class clown. I wanted to be the guy that kind of you know manipulated the way that the, the day worked out. And uh, I realized that you know the DJ made it all happen. So I started DJing early on and that made me money. And I I made more money on a Friday Saturday night. DJing than I did if I would have worked two weeks, you know, from an uh, an after school job. So that allowed me to make money within the confines that I had as an athlete. You know, people want to like, oh, I need money right now. My parents made it very clear to me: if you get good grades, you stay out of trouble, and you work your ass off on the, on on the on the sports field, we'll provide all the things you need. As far as you going to the movies and doing things that you want, that's on your own. You know, if you wanted Jordans, that's on your own. And because of that being ingrained in me early on, the things that I did want, I had to go work for. And um, that kind of laid, like, I think built a foundation of me knowing that nobody was going to give me anything, and I had to go get it. So, and, and, and what happened was it became, you know, I started to build some popularity as, as somebody that could be a go-to guy in, in the party scene or, you know, in the, in the high school and the college, you know, platform to be able to, you know, make a good amount of money so I didn't have to do those other things and sacrifice my ability to work out or my grades or, or training, you know, for my sport. And uh, that allowed me to then, you know, when I got to college, shit, I was cutting people's hair, you know, people on the team's hair because uh, I needed 10 bucks. And uh, you kind of pick up those other trades along the way just so you can make money. But um, as far as building the business around everything, I think the entrepreneurial spirit is what drives people. And uh, if you want that versus what you – it just becomes a different driver. So um, that was kind of you know, where I, you know, my entrepreneurial spirit came from. My driver, I think, is my mother because she hates the idea of me not working a union job. You know, my dad's a firefighter. My mom's a teacher. So they hate the idea of entrepreneurship. They hate the idea of, of anything that's not, that's not secure, that's not a nine-to-five, that's not a you go in there, you punch a clock, you come out, and you get a check as a very, very easy, identical transaction. You know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're a leader and you're running a business, you have to invest your time into something that you think that's going to give you a return, not today, but not even in two weeks but hopefully within two years. And I think a lot of people that are, you know, young entrepreneurs or even early stages startups and things like that, they miss the, the point. You know, you're, you, you have a skill set and a drive, and you're investing in yourself versus investing that time in a company that's already trusted to give you a paycheck. And uh, since she hated that idea, she became one of my drivers. You know, she used to get so mad that I, you know, she would worry that I was never going to be content And uh, early on, I learned that I'm never going to be content. So one of the things I told myself and told her was, I'm not content with where I am, but I'm content with the path that I'm on. And if I was always making progress, I was happy with that. Even if it wasn't uh, the paycheck that I could have got with another company, I know I earned it because it was mine. And I would rather have ownership of that paycheck, whether it be – you know, $100 or $10,000, that that was the way I wanted to kind of run my life on the business side. I think what you talked about with uh, that driver and what people are used to in your family, my family, uh, at least my father is similar, he's a teacher, and, and to this day, no matter any time when something is uh, not continuously on the rise or it's flat or even if you go slightly backwards, the first thing everybody in your family wants to do, and even people that are close to you that might just work, uh, in, you know, in a corporate environment, is go get a job. You know what I mean? And it's 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 so interesting to me how um, people and, and people that even you're closest to um, ha- have have a certain mindset. And when they see someone doing something different, um, it, it and they don't understand it that the, the, the first solution is you have to have a job. And that, um, you know, one of the things that I always love about being an entrepreneur 
And you do ride. I, I kind of get a high and low from riding the highs and you know, lows, and I kind of like that. It's just my personality. Um, so I can handle that very well, but other people around you are always not as good as handling that as well as you might be, and I have to be conscious of that. But I think the key is that um, when you're an entrepreneur, you're able to really dictate your future, good or bad, off of what you do, and your learning curve never ends. So even if it's, um, you know, right now I, I'm known for running camps and combines, but originally, not not too different than you, I was training people out of my, my truck back in 2001, you know, 2002. And um, it, and then I had a facility, and then I saw the camps go in a different direction and thought that was a better thing. And so as a, as a, 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 now I'm evolving in different ways. And, and you see how those things happen as an entrepreneur, and I think that's the beauty of it is that you get to tackle a path and you're not locked into one thing, and the only way to, do, to stay in that, that industry is to move up. And if you're in a position where it's, you're not able to move up, you're kind of stuck and you know, stimulate that mind. So I, I think it's really interesting how you talked about that. What What do you think we could do as entrepreneurs to, to help other entrepreneurs understand that that's what's going to happen and that, you know, help them to stay focused on what they really want to accomplish and understand whether they really want to be entrepreneurs? Yeah, so I, I – I think that it's a really interesting subject because it's, it's human behavior, right? It's, it's understanding that how, how do you handle stress? If you're not somebody that handles, you know, stress really well, then, then you probably aren't cut out for it. So then at that point, you're just like, you know, go, go get a job. Maybe that is the right thing. And that's probably why your parents or family or people that are the closest to you as supporters, right? Uh, you know, again, I, I use that word, they're supporters, but uh, they don't handle the bad times well. They handle the good times, right? They're super excited for you. I knew you could do it. I believe in you. Uh, but when it gets bad and you're tough and you're down and you just, sometimes you need a little bit of a bump and they, uh, they get down on it and they're like, go get a job. It's like, that's the easy way out. Like to go get a job is an easy way out. And if that's, the, if that's where you go, like if that's where you leak to and that's where your energy needs to go and your mindset, then you, you probably shouldn't be in the game because the best ones, like it, look at any success story, there's got to be some pitfalls. There has to be some, some, some negative to have triumphs. You know, you have to have some pressure to create a diamond. You have to have, you know, uh, some obstacle to overcome because if you don't have any obstac obstacle – then if it's such a linear path, then you won't be able to move or you probably aren't making that big of a jump anyways. So that's the first thing is like the reason why the people hold you back is because they don't want to see you stressed out, even though that's where you are very successful and that's where you thrive. And the areas that you're, you're stressed out in as a business owner or an entrepreneur understand that that is, that means that you're getting closer to, to not the finish line, but to the next tipping point. So, you know, the obstacle is the, is the biggest thing that's in front of you. And it's what you're, it's what you're, you're constantly stressed out about on a daily basis, but you have to understand that once you pass that obstacle, that becomes a platform for you to springboard into the next big thing you're doing. If it weren't for that obstacle, you wouldn't learn the skill sets that are necessary for you to take the next jump. And as an entrepreneur and as a business person, I feel that what people don't understand is that what gets you from point A to point B in your career is not the same skills that get you from point B to point C. And, you know, being a really good, you know, you were in the financial, you know, industry for a while and had a lot of success because of your work ethic. And then you took that same work ethic to something that you had a really good knack for and a skill set, which is eyeing talent, eyeing talent and then training that talent. And you then had to then leverage your information that you knew and your experience that you had in the financial side of the world to add a business to the training component. And if it weren't for some of the pains that you, you went through in your playing career, you probably wouldn't have the ability to eye, time, eye talent. If it weren't for some of your pains in your business career early on, you probably wouldn't have been able to understand that you could scale the business that you scaled. So I look at 
the obstacle as the as the platform for you to you know build off of. And I think a lot of people that don't look at it that way are probably not cut out for owning their own business because they're better off for like I need to make this money like I like I can't do the other stuff. Um, so I, I find that very interesting as well. But that stress that you kind of thrive off of, Dave, is because you you're an athlete, you're a competitor, you know. And I don't I don't mean that you know that people that are not athletes can't be competitors, uh, but there's it says something about like the competitive spirit that you're going to want to you know be at another level and when you're in a stressful situation you know how to get out of it because you don't like you know just kind of covering up like a boxer in a corner you you're covering up to the minute you see that opening you bob weave and throw a right hook and if you don't have that in you you're just going to be down for the count every time and maybe the best situation for you is to go get a job because it won't be as stressful but I truly believe that if you are cut out for it and you do have what it takes, perseverance is the difference maker. So, you know, for me, it's this pursuit uh, that I really enjoy. Yes. It, it, maybe we don't get there, but you, you'll get somewhere. And uh, it's that perseverance that, that tells you if you have it or you don't. I think the perseverance is, is, is critical and staying with it when um, – the times can be tough, and so there's a thing in business. Okay, as when I was getting my MBA, they used to talk about this, and then I was a business analyst in the technology firms. Um, uh, we used to talk about this, and but as an entrepreneur, it, it really is completely different. So there's a thing called crossing the chasm, where uh, you know business grows, and then they they kind of um, they have to get over this kind of chasm, they got to cross this chasm in order to get the real steep rise in their business. And, and I've been through that. Um, but I, what I really believe as an entrepreneur, and, and this they never teach you in business school, is that so the, you cross the chasm, your business rises, it flattens, and then ultimately plateaus and, and basically goes the other direction. Okay, but really as an entrepreneur, what you're really having is uh, and in your business, you're having multiple chasms based off of products you might have or a service to offer or whatever it is, and you have multiple chasms that you're going to have to cross, and sometimes simultaneously crossing those chasms um, in, in different areas. And I think that's the key, you know, as an entrepreneur, is that you're continuously fighting. You get to, to you know, hopefully you cross that chasm, you get to, towards a mountaintop, and then you figure out the next chasm that you got to cross and you got to continue. And it kind of just goes on like that as an entrepreneur. I kind of have deviated a little bit of what I wanted to discuss with you, but I think it's so interesting, um, you know, just discussing it. And, I mean, especially well, if you in, think about it, why, why, does, it, why does a team like, uh, like, a, like a Michigan years ago lose to a 1AA school, you know? And why does a, a big program lose to a smaller a team? Is it, are they that much better? You know, like, is that one double-A school, like, were they a sleeper? No, they weren't. You know what? They rose to the occasion. The other company, the other school or team got complacent. And because there wasn't that much pressure on them for them to win the game, they didn't prep as much. They didn't have their mindset ready. Physically, all signs show us that they're going to basically put 50 on the other team. And then they end up losing by, uh, by a field goal or a Hail Mary or the last play because they were mentally tough. And I think that kind of plays into the exact same thing you're talking about is as entrepreneurs, we have to be mentally tough because if not, if we're the big, you know, if we're a big school, we're a big football powerhouse and we're just getting softer by the day, some smaller business or some smaller obstacle is going to kick our ass when, when we're not ready for it. So, you know, you should get excited when there is a problem in your business because if you solve that problem, how much better would you be off? You know, and I think that's what people people put their heads down and they get all beat up because there's a problem in their business. There's no one tool that is going to fix the business. You have to take ownership of it, right? So once you figure that out, right? Once you figure out that that problem or you know that pressure that you're having, and you fix it that's when you move forward and you want one, another one of those because that means you're going to hit another big bump. And the more people that just stay away from that conflict in their business, the slower they're going to grow 
But if you think long term and you go, okay, if I uh, chopped it up into smaller moments, that every little you know chaotic moment or stressful moment that I I, I beat, that becomes just another win, and we don't have to deal with it again because we we you know, we know how to handle it moving forward. Think about all the you know, all the headaches that you have throughout the day when you don't learn something. Like if you don't know that traffic's going to be bad, but if you start to learn the traffic patterns, then you know don't go that route during a certain time of the day. It's so much less of a headache. So we have the same headaches in our business. We just need to know don't go that route. And we're going to have another obstacle later on, and that's fine because we now know that those what we thought was a big object is now just, you know, a grain of sand that we just beat. And I think we have to move past those things in our business, and that comes with mental toughness. I just think people are soft. And, and yeah, I say that on the sports side of things, but I talked about that in the HR world, is, is that everybody is so sensitive to being told oh. that they're not good at something. And that brings you me know? to something that, you know, I, I, I always say this, you know, and I, I guess it's a little bit political, but it really has nothing to do with who someone votes for or does vote for, but um, – when I see like the protesters out there protesting, and I always say, "Well, hold on, you're complaining. You could have taken action with your vote. You know, don't, you, you, when you go and complain after the fact, that's not as effective as taking action with your vote, and you have the opportunity there. And I, 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 I always find it interesting when there's there's a a, a process that's shown to you that if you do these things you can gain some level of success, or if you do these things, you may get an, a certain outcome. But what people don't realize, and, and this drives me nuts of a lot of culture today, is that just because you've been shown a path and you take some of those steps, whether you do or you don't, there's no guarantee that something goes your way. And then you have to deal with things. Once something doesn't go your way, how do you then deal with that fact, and what do you then do after? And I, to go and complain um, when it isn't a situation where something's actually happened or been done to you. Now, it's one thing to go and complain if there's been really something that's been done to you. But if, if nothing's actually been done to you, no action has actually happened against you, and you simply didn't get your way, then you have to figure out how to handle adversity. And our culture is so, especially younger people, have a hard time with handling any level of adversity. What do you do with your athletes to create that environment so they can handle it? And, and the, you know, I talked about people at uh, the beginning of the podcast that, you know, you work with a ton of NFL players, not just high school players, but all the way to guys getting ready for the NFL and guys that are in the NFL. So how, how do you help, you know, the people you work with in business or the athletes to overcome that adversity? Well, I think Pat Riley, the famous basketball coach, said it best. He said, hard work never guaranteed anything. But without it, you don't have a chance. And our society today is – is just afraid of hard work. They're, they're afraid of getting their hands dirty. And this is not a new generation. This is not a millennial problem. It, this, is a, this is an American problem. I mean, Thomas Jefferson basically said that, you know, uh, opportunity is, uh, is dressed in overalls and it's disguised as hard work. And because it's hard and you've got to get your hands dirty and you have to actually break a sweat, they think that there's not a good opportunity there. I'm a big believer that there's no such thing as a good or a bad opportunity. It's the preparation for that opportunity that matters. So if you're prepared, if I am fully prepared for my, my combine, my NFL pro day, my interview, my business venture, if I am fully prepared for that moment, whatever the, the tests are for it, even if it, if the things don't go my way in the sense that they didn't, they weren't coming out to see me. They were coming out to see another athlete or I wasn't projected as so high or I didn't get as much time as the other person. But if I destroy my opportunity and I blaze a 40, you know, and I go and run a four, three and I, you know, throw a bunch of reps up on that bench and I jump through the roof. And then if a coach grabs a pad and has me doing a position drills and I punch that thing, like I'm going to 
freaking punch through his chest because I'm so prepared for that opportunity. They're going to take notice. People will take notice if you're prepared. And if you're not prepared, they'll take notice as well, but they're just going to be able to say, I told you so. And you have to make that decision mentally. Do you, have to, do you want them to be right or you to be right? So how do I get somebody mentally strong? I make sure that I beat the crap out of them up in training so when the time is right, no matter what obstacle comes their way, they're 100% used to it. Think about high school football. I remember, you know, complaining that I couldn't throw the ball as a quarterback because it was wet and I had these little, you know, you know, junior whopper hands. And, you know, what does the coach do? You take out a, you know, we're going to do a water day, right? Every high school coach in the country that does it is if you, you can't throw the ball and it's supposed to rain on Friday nights, they dip that, that ball in water and they soak it. And if, if you don't practice that, you're going to use that as your excuse. So, you know, you practice the problem daily. And if you practice your problems, your problem in front of you at your, at your, pro day or at your testing day or at your interview or for your, you know, your, your day to pitch somebody becomes an opportunity for you to show them how well you're prepared and that that's not going to phase you. So I think that you have to art, you have to artificially create confidence by getting physically good at whatever the task is. And then once you artificially create the confidence, physically doing it, by doing it over and over, you'll get mental confidence, which means that it's going to ingrain. So that's how you get mentally strong. And that's how you're able to take these athletes and overcome some crazy things. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big believer that your mindset is what matters the most. And if your mind's not ready, it doesn't matter how talented you are, you could screw up. And um, that's why you see some of these guys who talk about them choking at the big game. You know, they have the same talent that they had a week ago. They just didn't come through, and they, they, they were, you know, choking in the clutch. Who are, who are some of the pro athletes uh, that you've worked with that are that you prepared um, for the NFL that, that some of our listeners might know? Well, you know, and I like, to, I like to talk about all the guys that not many people know of because they're making just the same amount of money. They're, doing, they're living their dreams, and nobody gave them a shot. Everybody, I mean, it's really easy for you and I, Dave, and you especially have a better eye than, 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 than most people in the industry for talent because it's what you did for over a decade. But it's really easy for us to pinpoint the, uh, the studs of the world, right? It's really easy for me to say, yeah, that guy's going to be, you know, a, a, a pro bowler. That guy's going to be a first-round draft pick. It's a lot harder to, to pinpoint the guys, and we don't know where they're going to go. So you look at a kid like, you know, Brian Parker, who, you know, didn't get recruited out of high school and goes to a school up in your neck of the woods, Albany. And, uh, and he ends up not being, you know, he wasn't even like a big name guy at Albany. And, you know, he ends up having a great pro day, jumps 39 inches, runs, you know, in the four fives as a tight end and uh, 260, 270 pounds and, you know, catches everything his way. And he gave himself an opportunity, and he's on an NFL roster. And guys like Devin Fuller, who everybody, you know, he was the number one kid coming out of high school, you know, in, in Jersey, and goes to UCLA and gets hurt. And they move him to wide receiver because of the skill set. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are questioning his durability, questioning, you know, to, is, he, is he that fast because he was hurt? He comes to us, and we train him, we get him healthy. And he goes out there, and he runs four threes in front of 100 hundred NFL, you know, scouts and personnel. And he gets drafted to the Atlanta Falcons. And then the guys that, as crazy as it sounds, Heisman Trophy candidates that are, you know, regarded as the best in the country in college football and don't think that they're going to scale to the NFL. And everyone, you have a bunch of naysayers to these people, like the Keenan Reynolds of the world. You know, Keenan is by far one of the hardest working athletes I've ever had the opportunity to coach. And what an honor for me to be able to work with such a, a high-class athlete, but a high-class person as well. I mean, this kid came out and did everything. 
he did he was up at five AM doing all of his military obligations, going to school, going to class, you know, taking care of his, his rounds. And then he would drive an hour to come train with me and then get back before midnight so he could do it again. So he doesn't have the same luxuries as the Jadavian Clownies of the world and the, and the Andrew Lux of the world that could go to these amazing you know, facilities and be basically babysat throughout the process versus being trained in, in the area that they need to show that they could scale to the NFL. So I really like talking about those stories, and, and not because I haven't trained some really you know, impressive athletes, but because everybody knows those guys. And, and, and frankly, those are the 1% of the 1%. And I really like to basically work with these, the underdog, the guy that if they didn't work, there's no chance. If you're, draft, if you're projected first, second, or third round, frankly, even if you have a bad pro day, you're going to drop a little bit, but you're not going to you know, make that big of an impact. But if you're projected fourth, third, fourth, all the way into undrafted free agent, and you have a bad pro day, you don't get a shot in the league. So I like to work with the guys that if you have a great pro day, great interview, you do everything right, you run a blazing time, you're going to get noticed. So they have to work. And I think that everybody feels like they're entitled nowadays more than ever. And I don't want to work with a type of client that feels like they, that I owe them something. You know what I owe them? I owe them the strategy to get them to where they want to be because that's what they're paying me for. They're paying me for an expertise that I possess that not very many people in the world do, which is to make somebody that's already an Olympic, you know, type athlete and make them better. A lot of people can make a a high school kid better. A lot of people can work with people that, you know, they've never trained before and get them faster. And a lot of people can work with the guys that are already the best and just keep them, you know, at that level. I got to work with the guys that are, are, that have been in a training program for eight years, four years of high school, four years of college, and have been training to get the maximum genetic potential out of their bodies and make them even better so they could showcase their ability. That's the guy I like to work with. So, you know, I, I have a lot of pride in taking those type of guys you know, for, you know, fourth round and below, fifth round projections and make them in the third round. I really enjoy that because you can make a huge bump in that person's life, just like in business, right? Everybody knows that Google is going to win right now. Everybody knows Facebook's going to win right now. You know, and that's why there's all these other startups coming on because they want to be the next Facebook. Um, but I, I big, I'm a big believer of, you know, if you work with that underdog, you can make a bigger impact. No doubt about it. Strategies you've used uh, in building your business and building your brand, what are some of the strategies that you've applied to, to help your success? Uh, owning, owning the mistakes, I think, is a strategy that a lot of people do not deploy because they're afraid of what people are going to say. I had a great high school career, and my college career was cut short, um, and unfortunately it wasn't what I wanted it to be. And it, it held me back in my career early on. So I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I used to get real personal and real offended when someone would come back at me and be like, hey, you know what, I wish you would have, you know, I wish I would have seen you more at that level. And I'm just like, you know what, did you just tell me I sucked, <laughs> you know? And it used to offend me. And then, now I just kind of use that as my stepping stone, you know? Um, and, and just knowing that, hey, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be everything to everybody, I, I'm very good at, uh, you know, a few things on the, uh, on the tactical side of things, and that's where I stay. And, and then what I do, even with the combine side of things, and specifically to my business, I bring in the experts at the highest level in what they do, and I bring them in. So in my weakness, I bring in the best person. So we have one of the best physical therapists in the country in our building. You know, we have a private chef in our building. So these are strategies that we could take and deploy in our business where why are we trying to, to work on an area that, that I know that even if I work my rear end off, I would never be as good as the private chef that I have that works with pro athletes all day. And I just bring them into the building. Why am I trying to be the guy that's going to provide food for them? What I'm going to do is I'm going to provide the expertise and bring them in, curate that information, bring the best person in, leverage their ability because that's what they want to do. And then now it allows me to do what I do really well, and I can be focused. 
And I think a lot of people don't want to own their mistakes. They don't own their story. And then they don't realize where they're weak and try to augment it with other people's uh, passion. Like if somebody has a passion for like working with injured people and getting them healthy, uh, I bring them into the building because I understand we get a lot of athletes that aren't, uh, you know, that have that have a couple of nicks. They have a banged up shoulder. They have a bad knee and a bad ankle, and I have to do the rehab. Well, why would I want to be the guy doing it if I could bring one of the best physical therapists in the world? I bring them into the building, and now the person that loves working with those types of people is going to have so much more energy and pride of of you know the time working with them than I would when my pride, like the thing that I kind of hang my hat on is I'm going to make sure that you jump out of the freaking building and your vertical. I'm going to make sure that you go out and run a 40 that people weren't even expecting to where they make you run it again because they don't believe the clock. And if you're running four twos and four threes when they're projected you to run four sevens at that level, you're going to turn some heads. So I would say stay in your lane, own your mistakes, and understand that you could easily make one of your weaknesses a strength by getting somebody else that's really, really good and bringing, it, bringing them into your corner. And those are some of the strategies and tactics that we've used in the building to, you know, help our business grow and help our brand grow. And uh, one of the things that we're doing now, which is, which is basically just documenting, you know, the, the process. And I think that that's becoming very interesting to a younger demographic. I, uh, I, don't, get ex- I don't get really excited to see myself on video but I do feel like it's an important aspect of our business because it's the way the younger generation views it. And we're, we're at a day and age where Facebook is no longer a messaging platform. It's a resume for businesses to see what you're really like and what they're going to be getting. Interesting. So, um, and you're talking about from content standpoint and, and I know you've met with, and in the last few minutes I want to talk a little bit about this. You met with Gary V and, uh, who's you know, always all over the place as far as uh, pushing his brand and pushing what he does personally um, and helping people get to where they want to be and, and with his philosophy of that. Um, what, what do you think about uh, some of the things that haven't met with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk? What do you think about some of the things where, you know, uh, when he says he, he's all in work-life balance, um, and, and where do those kind of things, does it exist or does your passion override everything? I mean, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it, uh, it's going to come down. So if you, 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 got ha- you have passion, you have principles. So if your passion is to, you know, build a business, but you don't have any principles, then you're going to step on anybody else to get your way. You're going to steal. You're going to rot. You're going to do things that are, that are outside of the code of ethics that maybe I believe in. So you have to have passion, you know, which is your, you know, your driver. You've got, to have, um, you've got to have principles because that's going to kind of guide you and say, okay, that's not the right decision for me right now. And then you have to have a purpose. I think your purpose and your passion are two separate things. You know, my purpose right, uh, may be different than training athletes. Training athletes and making them faster is a byproduct of my skill set. My purpose on the business component is, is to represent my, my family and God at, at the highest level that I'm capable of doing. So I have a lot of pride in that. And getting kids to college and getting kids to the next level is one of the things that drive me. My passion though, is, is seeing them be, be very successful. So I need to use tactics and skills to make that happen without questioning my principles ever. So when it comes to the question of balance, right, if those are ever out of balance, I think that you lost. Because, you know, I had a chance to spend, you know, a, whole, you know, a lot of time with Gary. And, and, and Gary Vandercheck is extremely impressive. So this is not a... This is not an attack on him or or the Tim Ferriss of the world that believes the exact opposite, which is the four hour work week. You know, I'm nowhere near that. You know, I, I if you know, working for four hours, like what the hell are you gonna do with your life? Like I actually don't think I have a job because I do what I love to do every day. But if you could have balance between 
you you don't need as much balance if you your job is what you love. If money is what you love, then it really doesn't matter. If if helping kids get to college is what you love, then you're going to do a lot of other things outside of the scope of the nine to five. You can't tell me you want balance if you want to be an entrepreneur. Because again, it's the ups and the downs, right? Like we've all had times in our business where it sucks, and it's like we have to work a hundred, like we have to work a lot more when when things are going well. Then when things are going good, we actually can take a day off. Not even taking a day off, but we could do other things with our time. And I think balance comes down to kind of where your priorities are. So it's strategic priorities. It's like, hey, what you need to learn about balance is I need to make sure that I have my home life in order if that's, what, if that my, if that's like my purpose, to be able to have my passion work really well. Because if, you know, how many business people are like they don't see their kids, they don't, they don't spend any time with them, they, you know, they're not happy, and then they're millionaires. Well, take some of that million dollars, right? Like you can't spend it all, you know, and I think Gary's on a mission to, to, to buy a, a, a pro franchise. It's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit more difficult if that's your end goal. You know, but if your end goal is to be happy and you've got to figure out what that is to you, then your balance should be surrounded around that. He's actually very well balanced as a person from my interaction with him because his end goal is to spend time with his family. And then I wouldn't say time. I think it's, an, it's, it's quality with his family. And, again, this is completely talking out of, out of, out of turn because I have no perspective other than what I've been, been fed from a media side. You know? Right, but, um, right. I think he's very well balanced because he is talking, you know, he's, he's spending the quality time with his family that he wants, and his end goal is to buy a, a pro franchise. So it's extremely balanced, and it's extremely organized to what he wants to accomplish. And if somebody wants to accomplish a different end goal, then, then their life and business needs to be balanced around that. The problem that I think that, you know, I have, that maybe Gary Vanderchuk has and that you have is when at the, you know, the youngest level, when a high school athlete comes to me and say, I want to play division one football, but yet they don't have the ability to balance a strong academic schedule, a strong athletic schedule and train and have any, Oh, I lose my social time. Well, so what? Too freaking bad. You don't want it bad enough. Then, then don't tell me, that your goal is that because you're not balanced with what that is required to be successful. So I think balance right, I think, comes down to having priorities and having uh, a plan and, a, and a, a, a game plan that's organized with your, your goal. If I could add one thing that I think also obviously falls into it with another letter, letter P, his priorities, where your priorities are, uh, you, have, you have passion. I think the principles, I think I love that, and, and the purpose that you have. But you also your priorities, I think, become an issue. And, and what do I mean by that? And I say this is to, to, to people as an entrepreneur. When things don't always go your way, sometimes you do have to figure out some ways to, to put food on the table if something in the meantime, right? So I would say don't give up on your entrepreneur. Go freelance. Go you know, go uh, go drive an Uber. Don't sacrifice your um, your ability to stay focused on what you want to accomplish just because you might need to make some money in the near term. Do something that allows you to still create and stoke that entrepreneurial uh, freedom while you might have to, you know, make make some money in the meanwhile. And if you do have to get a job in order to pay some bills, then you have to be dedicated when that job ends at 5.30 or 6 at night to working your next five or six hours if that's your priority uh, in, in building your business. And if your business, if, if your priority is really to spend, you know, you need to have X amount of time with your family that you really want to have, then you need to then reprioritize some of your goals and dreams because the one thing we do know about this, time is finite. You have 24 hours in a day, and you, you can't get those 24 hours uh, back as they go and click, click away. So you need to prioritize how you're going to spend those time and what those time, you know, what that time means to you. And I would say this, like when I coach football, I, I came back to coaching football this year, I made a conscious decision 
that it was a priority to me personally to coach football, knowing that some of the, the, the four hours a day that I'm over at football, four hour, five hours a day I'm at football, um, is going to sacrifice some other part in my life, whether it's business, family, or whatever. Um, that's something but you, ha- you can't lie to yourself and think that you're going to be able to do all these things and something doesn't get sacrificed. I think that's so well, critical. And, and I 100%, yeah, 100%, Dave. I, I think that you're absolutely right. Priorities are key. I think the biggest problem with people, especially younger people um, that are jumping into this entrepreneurial game, is that they're very much in denial of their skill set. So they want to be teaching. They want to be managing, right? So we, 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 we bred a generation that want to be managers post-college, but they've never done anything. And then now we're breeding this generation of entrepreneurial spirit and then them kind of do their own thing. If nobody is going to, you know, pay you the hourly wage that you want for the skill set that you potentially say you have, well, then you have to do something else in order to give your, yourself the opportunity to do the thing you enjoy. So, like you said, drive an Uber. I mean, you, there's no excuse nowadays with anybody with a driver's license to be able to make side money, you know. Um, and when we did it in, in, in our day and age differently, whether it be cutting grass or pressure cleaning or, walk, you know, walking dogs or, you know, whatever we had to do. And I think what happens is, is that nowadays these kids are in denial with, I could, I could suck at what my passion is and still get paid because it's what I want to do. I'm like, no, you can't. Like, you have to be good at it. So, like, Dave, if you wanted right now to consult on recruiting or consult in, 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 in sports business, you could ask for a lot of money in that area. Even if that wasn't your passion, you could ask for a lot of money in that area because you've, you've shown and proven a successful model. Yet, if people that have never done it before ask for that same amount of money, there's no way they're going to get it. And they're wondering why they're only getting one or two clients. You know? It's like a trainer that if you're good, you're gonna, your doors are going to be packed. And you could up your prices as you get more people because you understand the demand there. But if you suck at your job, you can't ask for more money, and you can't complain about the situation. What you do is, in the beginning of your career, you should be spending 70% of the time in the area that returns the money that you need right now, so you could do 30% of the stuff you love, and then over time, as you get better at acquiring the skill set that you want to do long term, you could start shifting that scale over and start getting to do... 40% in the area that you love and then do 50 and then you're doing half the shit you hate to be able to do half the shit you love. And then you get to the point where that number is 90 to 10, where 90% of the stuff I do all day long and that you do all day long is the things that you love and brings back the return that you're you're valued at. But you still have to do 10% of the stuff that you don't like because you need to either get better at it or it's going to give you the opportunity to do the 90% of the stuff that you're really good at. And most people just don't want to do that. They don't want, they don't want to start out doing 90% of the stuff they hate to get to that point. And that's the reason why most people don't make it. Uh, agreed 100%. I mean, I think that's, that's the key. And, and, you know, actually, there's one of the things I love that Gary Vee talks about, that self-assessment and, and being able to self-assess uh, what you're actually doing, and and, and know if it's know if it's good or bad, and 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 understand if it's good or bad. You know how to capitalize on the good, but if it's not good, are you willing to change that, and really willing to change that in a way that you could become successful? Because you're right, people people definitely lie to themselves, and and look, I do it sometimes. You know, I lie to myself. I I like I want to do this. I I. I think I could do that, and just the, the doggone truth is I can't. And so after I learned that, I have to be willing uh, to to figure out another way to do it, and that's, I think, an important key. Well, listen, uh, this, I can't believe an hour flew by, but it did, I guess, because me and you could talk better than anybody else. Um, and, and that's what – I think that's what uh, – uh, uh, makes it so interesting to talk to you and what you have to impart. Where can people find you, you know, your website for, for training? Um, you know, if people just want to talk to you, uh, uh, where can they find you? Well, I mean, 
in this, this day and age, it's, it's social. It's pretty easy. It's Coach Cav, uh, K-A-V, or Coach Cavanaugh. Um, as far as the website goes, which is kind of like our hub of our business, is trainssi.com. And if I could kind of impart two things on, on the audience, whether it be athletes or, or business people, is that the, the number two things, the two things I tell athletes that make them successful, I get this question asked to me more times than, than I even want to count, is like what makes an athlete successful? At the highest level, at the NFL level, they're all talented. They're all good. Now, there's different scales to that, but they're all that good because you wouldn't even be in the conversation if you weren't. So the number one thing is awareness of your skill set. Like you have to know, you have to be so self-aware, you have to, like you were talking about, you have to be so self-aware of how good you are and where you fit so you're able to know your role and then you know how to make a roster spot. The number one roster spot and the number 53 roster spot doesn't matter. Just get on the damn team. So that's the first thing, and you can't do that if you don't know your skill set. People are in such denial about if I'm a DN or a linebacker, just do whatever they need. The second thing is health. So if it, you're in business, you've got to be healthy. You've got to have your mental health, you have to have your physical health, and you have to have your spiritual health. In the sport of football, if you're hurt, you're not valuable to anybody. You're a liability. So you have to be very aware of your skill set, know your role, and know how to make it make the team. And then number two, to stay on that team and stay at the top, whether it be in your business or in life or on a football team, you have to be healthy. That's unbelievable and I think so important. And I really, truly appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I can't wait to send this out to everybody, this podcast. And, uh, you know, for you, it'll be on iTunes. It'll be everywhere, but it'll be on iTunes. I'll post it uh, on social. And, um, you know, it, this this has been an amazing hour of really just covering a lot of time, much more than I even expected to cover. Um, you know, so the people that get to listen to this, they will get to learn a lot. And, you know, both myself and Cav built things from the ground up. Uh, it wasn't like people were throwing money in our pocket. You build it from the ground up. And uh, when you build it from the ground up, you get a true appreciation for what it takes to to, to be successful. And, you know, it's nice to get that Silicon Valley money, but when you, you, you build it yourself, you can then help others also learn how to do that as well. Absolutely, and it's been an honor. And, you know, when it comes to that Silicon Valley money, I'll take it too, but I'll also take it back <laughs> from the streets in New Jersey, New York, or Miami any day of the week over a guy from, you know, Napa or, uh, you know, drinking the wine. So that's my thoughts, and, uh, you know, I appreciate it. It's an absolute honor, Dave. All right, man. Have a great, great day, and I definitely obviously will be talking to you soon. You got it, man. That was Justin Cavanaugh. SSI training, Sport and Speed Institute. Make sure you check him out. I mean, he is he is nothing short of uh, electric. His ideas on business, his ideas on uh, the training industry, on sports, and what it takes to be successful. Another successful life podcast. Great success. When this podcast goes out there to everyone, make sure you listen to the whole entire thing. And I know I'm talking at the end of it, but um, this podcast is exceptional. Till the next time for the Successful Life Podcast, my name is David Schumann. I'm not just someone who uh, is advising on business, but have built the business and ridden the highs and lows so I can help you to become successful. We'll see you next time. When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be hard. 
like early 90s heavy metal art. I'm yelling and screaming and I'm loud. Roar. Geico makes it easy. You can review and update your policy or report a claim on Geico.com or the Geico mobile app. Because shouldn't we all have a little less stress in our lives? I'm not even upset about anything! Hey, I'm here at your Metro PCS store. What's the best deal I can get for switching over? How does a free smartphone sound? Sounds good, but is it a tiny smartphone? Nope. Five inch HD screen. Good brand? Great brand. Samsung. And it's a Galaxy. So I got a free Samsung Galaxy? Yeah. You're a tough man to bargain with. Everyone gets a free Samsung Galaxy on 5 at Metro PCS. Switch today and get a free smartphone after instant rebate. Yes, a free Samsung Galaxy. Metro PCS. Wireless figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales stocks not included. Not valid for numbers currently on the T Mobile Network. See store for details, terms, and conditions, and network info.